Okay, today I want to talk about Rav Shaul, especially the book of Romans, the letter he wrote. And, uh, you know, people argue about chapter 7, whether that is autobiographical, whether he's really talking about himself. Uh, they look at that Greek word ego. Uh, I, it means I, the uh, first person pronoun, singular, I. Is he, is he, in what sense is he talking, I, me, Paul, you know? But if you go through and you count all the I's, all the my's, all the me's, you see they're all over the place. And what I want to tell you today is that if you read this book, the book of Romans, and you don't read it as a Calvinist and try to make everything fit Calvinism, you don't read it as an Arminian and try to make everything fit uh, Arminianism, you don't read it as a Torah observant Messianic Jew and try to make everything fit that. Uh, but instead, you just read it and see that he's giving his testimony. And it's all about him. It's all auto autobiographical. It's all, in other words, when he talks about the, um, the he says, you who are Jewish, uh, who consider yourself uh, a guide to the blind, well, if there was ever a blind guide leading the blind, it is Paul the Apostle. As a matter of fact, on the Damascus Road, he was struck with blindness to show him quite literally that he was a blind guide. And so uh, when, you, when you start going through the book and reading it, you see it's all about him. He's giving you his testimony. And uh, today I want to just open the Orthodox Jewish Bible here and uh, I, I want to try to mention a couple of things. As a matter of fact, I'm going to sort of go through uh, Romans quickly here. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 17, he's talking about the Tzitkat Hashem versus the Tzitkat HaTorah. Uh, righteousness that comes from God or righteousness that comes from observing the Torah. Uh, and he's contrasting those. And he's going to tell you that you can't be justified by the law. Even the Torah, you cannot be justified by it. He's going to tell you that in chapter 3, verse 28. Chapter 4, verse 2. Abraham was not justified by the mitzvot ha-Torah, by, by doing the mitzvahs. Uh, Galatians 2, 16. But I'm, I'm not going to get outside of Romans now. I'm just going to talk about Romans he, he's, the, he's the one under the wrath of God. He says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Well, you know, that's literally true. On the Damascus Road, he met the one who is going to be presiding at the great assize. The, the, the one who is actually the judge for the Yom Hadin. The, the day of judgment, judge, the, the last judgment. Yes, the last judgment. He had a kind of preview of the last judgment. Uh, you know, a, an anticipatory, proleptic uh, preview of the last judgment. It was almost like on the Damascus Road, there he was, the last judgment and the judge. And he's got to get right with this judge. Uh, He's, he, he, he says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Chapter 1, verse 18. But in this book, he tells you that he himself was a vessel of wrath and that God turned him into a vessel of mercy and he did it by grace. And now he's under grace. He's not under any kind of uh, uh, legal... Uh, uh, Zoham earning uh, uh, mitzvahs uh, type of uh, to Torah justification and and uh, he, he he's the one who exchanged the truth about Mashiach for a lie. Who is a bigger liar than the man who says that Yeshua is not the Messiah? And he was that liar. And 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 and, and, and he's he's going to show how God took him out of wrath and put him uh, into a, a, a mercy situation. And God can have mercy on whom he uh, wants to have mercy. And, uh, and he had mercy on Moses, 
uh, but he raised up Pharaoh as a, a, an object of wrath to show forth his glory. Uh, he had mercy on Paul. Um, he, he is the fallen son of Adam with a carnal mind, uh, in, uh, a slave to het kadmon sin. Um, and notice, when you see the word sin uh, in Romans, most of the time, if not all the time, it's about uh, the, the fallen human nature, the carnal mind that processes everything in a sinful way. It's not so much individual actual deeds of sin. It's the sinner you are, not just the sin that you do. And, and, and when he talks about death, he means eternal death, my friend. Eternal, he's not talking about just a physical uh, death. Uh, so he, he is the fallen son of Adam. And let me tell you something, his whole religion is based on Abraham. And, and, and when you go to the Torah and you look at the Torah, the whole beginning of the Torah is the genealogy of Abraham, starting with Adam. All those people bring us to Abraham genealogically. And, 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 and he, had the, he had the wrong idea about Abraham. Uh, he had to get that, that idea. He had to be disabused of that idea. And, and he himself was without excuse when he talks about uh, that in, in Romans uh, chapter 1. Uh, and, and he was the persecutor storing up wrath for the day of wrath in uh, uh, chapter 2. And because he was sitting under the law, he was going to be judged by the law. And, uh, and, and he didn't see that Adam is a type of the Mashiach. And just as Adam brought death, and, 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 and he also brought a kind of uh, a terrible warped humanity, het kadmon sin that reigned from Adam to Mashiach, who's the last Adam. Uh, since, since all of that is true, uh, he, he saw, uh, he began to understand why he needed salvation, why, why he could not be justified by the law. Uh, and, he, and when we get to chapter 7, we'll see that. But the secrets of his heart were judged. Uh, Romans chapter 2. Uh, judged by whom? By the Mashiach. Hallelujah. On the Damascus Road. So he's describing himself in chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, he's the blind guide leading the blind. Uh, when he talks about Jewish people. Uh, He's talking about himself in chapter 2, verse 25, and chapter 7, verse 15. Uh, when he speaks about the bris milah, that, 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 that bris milah was his boast, uh, but that boast was undermined by his inability to, to keep the Torah. If you, if you have the bris milah and you keep the Torah, then great, but... But if you don't keep the Torah, it's almost like you didn't have the bris milah. And these Goyim, who are becoming believers, who have the Torah of Jeremiah 31 uh, written in their heart, they're going uh, to show you that you are not the Jew you need to be because you don't have the spiritual circumcision of the heart that, that, that Moshe talked about. And because of original sin... I do not observe what I want to do. I don't observe, I don't do, I don't, I don't observe the law. Uh, so look at chapter 2, verse 25, and chapter 7, verse 15. The, the good I want to do, I don't do. Uh, because uh, uh, within me there is a, a fallen humanity, a carnal nature working against me. Uh, he's the man who needed the uh, circumcision of the heart by the Spirit of God, chapter 2, verse 29. Uh, uh, he, he had to have the new birth. A Jew has to have the new birth, my friend. Uh, chapter 2, verse 29. Uh, he has to have this, the Ruach HaKodesh. The written code is not enough. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the circumcision, look, he's not against circumcision 
Look, look at Acts chapter 21, verse 21. A, a false rumor against him, saying that he opposed it all over the world. Not true. Romans 9, verse 6. What if some did not have faith? He's talking about himself there. He didn't have faith, but then he did have faith. And, and, and a hardening has, has come in, in part to Israel. But in the same way that he came to faith, so all Israel will eventually come to faith. And he is exhibit A. He's the specimen they need to look at. Yes, he was a liar, chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, but then he made the confession. Look, if you will confess with your mouth, Mashiach, Adonai, and believe in your heart. Hallelujah. With a new heart, a circumcised heart, a born again uh, heart. You will be delivered. And, and, and he was under the power of sin, chapter 3, verse 9. Sin is a power, my friend. Amen. It's a power that, that, that was unleashed uh, in the beginning, the first man. Uh, he, and, and it affected all of the B'nai Adam, including me and you. Uh, so he's, he's trying to, to, to get right and stay right with God. And he can't do it by observing the law. Chapter 3, verse 20. He has to do it by faith. And, and law, the Torah, does not bring justification. But he is a, a, a machmir, uh, observant Jew. Nevertheless, you say, well, why? Because he's a Jew. And because he sees Mashiach in every jot and tittle of the Torah. And, and he preaches uh, Mashiach in every jot and tittle of the Torah. And, 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 that, and that's, he's under obligation to everybody to preach Mashiach, the, the, the goal redeemer. And, uh, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, the glory of original righteousness that Adam had that was lost. We, we've, we, we are all now B'nai Adam. We've lost it. We've, we, we've fallen short of that glory. He was made in the image of God. Now we have to be uh, remade, recreated in the image of Mashiach. And, 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 and when, he, when he gets to Mashiach and the, the tree, well, how does he describe it? He uses a Greek word from the Septuagint, illustrion, which means literally the mercy seat and the caporet that was on the Aron Kodesh, Leviticus 16. And, and, and he is the lamb of redemption. Uh, yes, uh, he is the lamb of redemption, but he is also the kapora uh, who calms down the wrath of God. Uh, you see, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, but Mashiach's uh, sacrifice is a propitiation of that wrath. And that's found in chapter 3, verse 25. So he is, a, he is a man who lives and breathes the Torah, but he sees Moshiach in every word, in every verse of the Torah, just as Moshiach said he would, according to Luke chapter 24. And according to uh, Johannan, where he says, you, 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 you read these words because you want eternal life, but these words are about me, the Moshiach. But a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Look, look at this, chapter 3, verse 28. So yes, he's observant, but he's not depending on the mitzvahs for his uh, salvation. Abraham was not a boaster about uh, the merit that he earned from mitzvahs. Uh, and uh, he, he saw that about himself, that, that Paul could not be a boaster. He had been a boaster, but now he's not a boaster. He had to be disabused of Tzitkat HaTorah, uh, chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, and uh, being a physical descendant of Abraham is not enough. Look, there were, two, there were twins in, in Rivka's womb, chapter 9. Uh, they both were descendants of Abraham. But that wasn't enough. One has to be called according to the promise. What promise? Uh, the, 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 the Abraham, he was called according to a promise. The, the promise has to do with God's sovereignty, how he's promising certain things and bringing them about. 
uh, and, and uh, look at chapter 4, verse 13, where you see that word promise, and then you see it again in chapter 9, verse 8. Uh, and, and then he talks about uh, not, not depending on being a physical descendant of Abraham to get into heaven. Uh, it, it didn't help Esau, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Uh, uh, so Yeshua, our Lord, this is, this, is the, this is the Savior. Hallelujah. This is who you have to turn to. Now, I, I've just been going through a few, a few ideas here, but I guarantee you, if you will go through the book of Romans, and if you will ask God to show you, he will actually reveal to you, this is Paul's autobiography from first to last. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. You say, I don't believe that preachment. Uh, death is just a biological phenomenon. I, I don't believe that sin transmits uh, generationally like you're saying. I don't believe that I have this uh, death in me. Paul talks about who will deliver me from this body of death. The, the good I want to do, I don't do. This, this original sin, het kat moan thing in me. Uh, uh, who will deliver me? And look, uh, I want to be delivered. I, I want life. Hallelujah. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. He met eternal life on the Damascus Road. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Rav Shaul. And, and so uh, this is what confronted Rav Shaul on the Damascus Road. It's not a theory, my friend. It's not theology. It's a fact. The Damascus Road was real, my friend. It was like a proliptic Yom Hadin. Uh, uh, proliptic means anticipatory. It was Rav Shaul. It was him having a preview of the last judgment. And Moshiach was giving him a preview of the second coming. The Shiv Shel Moshiach, the return of Moshiach. He had that on the Damascus Road. And just as Kipa previewed this same event at the Transfiguration, the Hahish Tanut, the Transfiguration. So Rav Shaul previewed this event on the Damascus Road. So you have Kipa on, on the Mountain of Transfiguration. You have Rav Shaul on the Damascus Road. They're getting a preview. God is, has mercifully previewed them. The, the Last Judgment, the Yom Hadin. Friend, don't talk to me about Yom Kippur. Don't talk to me about Rosh Hashanah. Don't give me some little, our rabbis say this and our rabbis say that. I'm talking about you standing before Almighty God, a holy God at the greatest size, the great white throne. Are you gonna be a sheep? Or are you gonna be a goat? Uh, and, 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 and Rob Shaul was shown that he was a goat. He was a vessel of wrath, under wrath. And even the Torah brings wrath. Where there's no pesha, there's no, there's no penalty, there's no onesh. Uh, but but when, when there is a, a, a penalty, uh, because of het kadmon, we, we can't, we can't have legal justification. We can't have legal sanctification. It's impossible because the flesh uh, wars against the spirit. And the Torah only shows us what sinners we are. Uh, so uh, he saw the preview. Have you seen the preview? Uh, instead of death, which is what Paul knew he deserved, it's the spirit. And the Torah only shows us what sinners we are. Uh, so uh, he saw the preview. Have you seen the preview? Uh, instead of death, which is what Paul knew he deserved, he, the persecutor, encountered grace. Hallelujah. Can you say praise God? Praise God. Hallelujah. So now a rabbi who studied under the Tana Gamaliel begins to rethink the Torah about this one whose name means mankind. That's what Adam means, who's a type of the last Adam who is to come, whom Rav Shaul personally met on the Damascus Road. Think about it. Rav Shaul met the last Adam, and now he's able to go back and look at the first Adam and understand him. 
because he sees him as a type. And this is just the, 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 the just as the power of Het Kadmon entered through Moshiach, I, I mean, through his, ty his, uh, his type, uh, and just as with this power entered spiritual mavet or death, I'm talking about mavet um, olam, eternal death, spiritual separation from God. So uh, this this mavet, this spiritual separation, spread to kol b'nei adam, and, and and how do we know this? Because all sin. There's a phenomenon, a phenomenological. Uh, observation you can see everybody sins why is that you should find at least one sadik out there who doesn't ever and, ha and and has never sinned and there are some in the Hasidim who say oh yes we found him right over here here's his picture here's his grave and they're wrong they're deluded when Rav Shaul expresses this autobiographically he says it like this I was once alive but then the commandment came and I died and we've all died spiritually. We're spiritually dead. Amen. And we're, we're talking about spiritual death, spiritual separation from the Beshepher, from the Creator. And, and, and before, as a rabbi, he preached the Torah. It says, uh, Ye shall therefore be shomer over my hukot and my mishpatim, which if a man do, he shall live by them. So he thought, I'm going to find life. I'm going to live by the Torah and have life. I'm going to have life everlasting. Uh, so being Jewish, a child of Abraham with bris milah, and, and doing the 613 Taryag mitzvot, he thought he was doing what he, you know, what would help him achieve a righteousness of his own so that he could merit chaye olam, eternal life. So then he met Haye Olam in person. And he found out that the one that he had been persecuting was in fact Haye Olam himself. <laughs> what a revelation. Then he realized that as, as a Torah teacher, he was a blind guide. And the Torah was the embodiment of the truth, yes. But the Torah is supposed to bring you convicted and contrite to Mashiach because the Torah makes sin utterly sinful, provoking uh, the, the wrath of God against sinners, the burning fury of a holy God against all unholiness. So now he has to rethink everything. So Rav Shaul starts right away autobiographically, and he lets you know there is such a thing as suppressing the truth or holding down the truth and, and holding it down in unrighteousness. And Romans 1.18 uh, and, and, and this, this is an ungodly, wicked thing that men do. All men do it. It evokes the burning fury of God. And men have to be found out and exposed and arrested and divinely caught in the act of doing so. That they are suppressors of the truth. Oh, no, no, don't talk about that here. Uh, no, uh, okay, well, that's fine for you. And I'm glad you have uh, your religion and everything. But don't, look, we, we, we don't want to hear that in here. Listen, we have separation of church and state, right? So as long as you are in the capital rotunda, say nothing. We don't even want street preachers here. We are holding down the truth. Yes, you're holding down the truth, sir, because you're a liar. Let God, let God be true and every man a liar. And every man is a liar from Adam. It's called Het Kadmon. And... And, and he saw he was in trouble and that God's fury was going to flare out at him and destroy a lying Judas like him and a lying Judas like me. I, you're supposed to see this. This is about you. It's not just Paul's autobiographical buster. It's your autobiography. You're supposed to read Romans and say, oh, this is me. We're talking about me. The liar was caught in his lie. He had to confess that he was blindly spreading a lie, holding down the truth in unrighteousness, keeping men from being saved. He was a wretch. He was serving and working for and peddling sheker. And he was, it was either confess the truth or be destroyed. And on the Damascus Road, he 
confess the truth. Who has resisted his will? Who, is, who has resisted his will? So you semi-Pelagians out there who think it's just a matter of going into the voting booth and, and you can either vote for the devil or vote for Yeshua. Well, I, my brother, he didn't make a decision, but I made a decision. My friend, the second half of Romans, uh, actually Romans chapter 5, is a summation of what is understood to be the gospel, which is that man needs a redeemer. And, and there is a universality of sin and death. We're talking about het kadmon, original sin, uh, a fallen humanity that always uh, chooses something less than what God really wants. And then we're talking about death, not just physical death, but eternal death. And this man is hopeless. He's helpless. He, he, it says, in the right, just at the right time, Moshiach died for, for, the, for the helpless, for the weak. Like me, he died for me, even for his enemy. I'm the enemy. When you see that word enemy, he's, he's a talking autobiographically. Who was a bigger enemy than him? But Mashiach, who is an antitype of Adam, has come to reverse the condition brought about by Adam, who, who is a, the type of Mashiach. So sin is triumphed by righteousness and death is triumphed by life. And the new Adam will say, my food, the food not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, a moral autonomy, my food is to do, that, that is not my own will, as in moral autonomy, but to do the will of him who sent me. Hallelujah. So he's a different Adam. He's the final Adam. So one man is the source of death. The other man is the source of life. The, 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 the one man is a foil of the second man. The last man's work is, is inexplicable without the first man. So there are two gardens, one of error, one transgression, one mitzvah, one righteous deed. And then you have physical death is the separation of the body from the spirit. Spiritual death is the spiritual separation of each of us from God. Eternal death or the second death is the eternal separation of a person from God. And there's no escape from that second death. So Paul is under obligation to preach to everybody. The wages of sin is death. I mean, temporal, spiritual, and eternal death. But the gift of grace, the gift of God is Haye Olam. Amen. Amen. If it is your fear that my autobiographical interpretation of Romans is eccentric, look at what Henry Alford says in his classic commentary on Romans chapter 8, verse 2. There is no stronger proof to my mind of the identity of the speaker in the first person throughout, it means throughout the book of Romans, with the Apostle himself. Then this extension of that form of speaking into this chapter, nothing more clearly shows that there he was describing a really existing state within himself, but insulating and as it were, exaggerating it as so often to bring out more clearly the glorious deliverance to follow. So here Paul is talking about the uh, Het Kadmon determinate principle that functions like a law, like the law of gravity always brings you down. The law of uh, the law at work in my members, uh, the the law that works in the carnal mind, uh, waging war against the law of, of my mind. In other words, uh, with my intellect, I delight in the Torah, but there's another law at work waging war, as it were, against the law of, of my mind, and that's this determinant principle called Het Kadmon, 
And that's why legal justification and legal sanctification are impossible because the carnal mind works against the Torah and is actually stirred up as a result. So uh, the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life, that is the determinate principle of the Ruach HaKodesh, uh, where, whereby I'm regenerated and I put to death the deeds of the flesh and I walk in the spirit, and I, I have a mind that is, that is uh, conversant with the Spirit, and I walk uh, in the, in the uh, blessing of the Ruach HaKodesh, and in the, the, the light of that new birth. This is what chapter 8 is all about. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature on what that nature desires. Um, now, to to be carnally minded is death, uh, and I must I must by the Spirit of God I must put to death the deeds of the flesh, uh, so that I can live, and and I can do that. I I'm able to walk in the newness of life. I would like to uh, encourage you to go to Bible Hub and click on OJB for Romans 8 commentaries and look at the, com at the uh, translation of the Orthodox Jewish Bible, especially for Romans chapter 8. Amen. So on... Um, the 18th of August, which was our homeless night, we were preaching in a homeless shelter. And four days before that, we were in the Hasidic areas. And, and what were we doing? We were giving out the four spiritual laws in Yiddish and in English. And it begins, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And some people say, well, I don't like that pre presentation because maybe God doesn't have a wonderful plan for your life. But uh, it's based, I believe, on Romans chapter 9, uh, which uh, is all about there were two twins in Rivka or Rebecca's womb. And before they did any Avera, transgression, or any mitzvah, righteous deed, anything good or bad, any one of the mitzvot ha-Torah, or the zohar earning, merit earning works of the Torah, before they had done anything, in order that, that God's purpose, his toknit, his prearranged plan uh, in the uh, Bahira, uh, the the election, in order that it might continue, in order that it might stand. Uh, she was told the older will serve the younger. So you see, God, God had a plan. Now, I've, I've been saying that when you read Romans, you have to read it with the idea of, it, of the fact that it, it, Paul is speaking autobiographically, autobiographically about himself. And, and it, it should be obvious that, that election is, is playing a part here uh, and also God's plan. Because do you remember when Yehuda committed suicide and there were 120 in the upper room, and Kipa stood up. And then he said, look, we've got to have somebody who was with us from the beginning who could be a shaliach witness from the time of Yohanan Hamadbil mm -hmm. uh, to the present who uh, witnessed the resurrection, the Tahiyas Hamoshiach, and, and, and is an eyewitness of, of everything. We have to have someone 
to fill the pe, pe, the uh, pakuda, the the charge, the office, the uh, leadership slot, so that that uh, that there will be eleven standing with me. And of course, we know that on Shavuos, uh, when he went into the uh, Beis Hamikdash, the the, the uh, court of the Gen the court of the Gentiles, the Ulam Shlomo, and he stood up and he preached the first uh, drasha. There were eleven men standing behind him because the slot was filled, and uh, they they drew lots. But you know, there seems to be a theme in the Book of Acts that really that slot was filled quite supernaturally, God took the chief of sinners, he took a persecutor, and he seized him and changed him and made him a shaliyak. This would be sort of like Osama bin Laden, he's planning 9-11, uh, he's going to, uh, you know, destroy those 3,000 people. Uh, and... Uh, the next thing you know, uh, the whole thing has been canceled and he's uh, uh, staff uh, with the Billy Graham crusade. He's now an evangelist going all over the world preaching the gospel. Now, you say, Osama bin Laden becoming a, an evangelist? Impossible! Well, that's exactly what it was with Rav Shaul. Completely impossible. But he's wanting you to know that God seized him and changed him. And it was, uh, a, 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 it was a glorious, supernatural miracle because God had a plan that when the great throng of the elect, the myriads and myriads and myriads of, of people uh, streaming into heaven, when that day comes right at the head, with Kipa and the, and the Eleven, there will be this one man, this Osama bin Laden persecutor. His name is Rav Shaul. Now, you see, it, it, unless you've been involved in Jewish ministry in Brooklyn or in Israel, uh, unless you've, you've, you've actually stood face to face with these persecutors mm -hmm. and seen the hatred in their eyes, mm -hmm. and, and unless you've been a victim of their... Uh, their little things that they do, you know, uh, throwing garbage in front of your building, uh, standing between you and the YouTube camera when you're trying to preach, uh, uh, you know, uh, the bomb threats, the destruction of property, uh, uh, blowing up a van, uh, stealing a car, and, and, and unless you've actually been around the assault type persecutors, you have no idea what what a miracle it is if one of them would would become a believer. Mm -hmm. It would truly be an Osama bin Laden miracle, yes. and that's what happened here. And he's trying to tell you autobiographically that God had a plan mm -hmm. to put a persecutor at the head of the throng of the elect, mm -hmm. and and that plan he worked out, and nothing. Can, can thwart that plan. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor things to come, nor things in heaven, things on earth. Nothing can thwart that plan. God is working out his plan. He has a, a prearranged plan. So he does have a, a wonderful plan for your life, at least in this respect, that Rav Shaul is under obligation to give everybody this plan. Now, if you want to say, well, that's your plan, God, that's not my plan, uh, and, and throw it in the garbage, you can do that. But uh, Paul is still under obligation to you, whether you are a Greek or uh, someone who doesn't speak Greek, whether you're a sage, whether you're a wise rabbi, whether you're uh, someone who isn't wise, it doesn't matter. He is under obligation to everybody. And that means that if you're on his wavelength and you study this book and you understand it, you really want to have one of these in your pocket all the time because you never know when you're going to have a divine appointment. 
when somebody is going to be presented to you. Uh, I should have had one of these in my pocket this morning. I went into Starbucks to get some coffee, and there was this guy, and he was asleep. He looked like a well-heeled millennial who had a good job. Maybe he was a, uh, an app developer, whatever. But on his, on his bare arms were all these scribbles, mm -hmm. all these tattoos. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, he'd obviously been up all night partying, drugging, whatever. And he was slumped over and he was asleep. And, and, and it was almost uh, nine o'clock in the morning and he was asleep. And he looked like some kind of, of horrible case from Calcutta. Somebody that uh, Mother Teresa would be scraping off the street. It's because, you see, he's bought into all the, the millennial stuff. And, and he, he believes all of the isms of the day. And he doesn't think that he needs this or that it's real. Mm -hmm. And so he has discarded it. He is now without religion, a religionless person, someone who uh, would mock uh, the faith. And, and this is what we have to reach now. The, the so-called post-Christian uh, world where people have long since uh, apostatized from all of that. And I'm telling you that if you will go back and read this book, you will see that a persecutor breathing out murderous threats, a Pharaoh doing the same, that God can take one for noble purposes and he can leave the other for common use. He has that choice. He could do that. Pharaoh, uh, just one more enemy of God that was destroyed. Paul, one more enemy of God that was turned into his shaliach, his servant, his slave, his apostle, his replacement for Judas Iscariot, you, you might almost say. There he is. And, and, and who has resisted his will? And, and the objects of wrath prepared for destruction, the pharaohs and the, and the, and the Hitlers, they're on one side, but the objects uh, 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 prepared for mercy, the, the Pauls, the, the Paul, the apostle, uh, former persecutors. You see, you might think, well, this doesn't seem fair because who has resisted his will? But the point is, even believers still have to put to death the deeds of the flesh. This is not an antinomian gospel. If you are a believer and you are regenerated, uh, then by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, you must put to death the deeds of the, of the flesh so that you might live. So uh, yes, uh, we have a will. We have a, a free will. Even after we become believers, we still have to do what Paul said. Remember what he said? I pummel my own body and bring it to subjection, lest preaching to others, I myself become a castaway. So uh, that's in 1 Corinthians, I think chapter 9, verse 27. I can't remember. But anyway, that, that's the point I'm trying to make here. That uh, Romans chapter 8 Verse uh, 13, for if, it's, it's just a little two-letter Greek word, but it's a big if. If you live according to the flesh, the sinful nature, the old fallen nature in Adam, you will die. And he's talking about eternal death. Uh, uh, so keep this in mind. We don't sin even more so that grace will abound. God forbid, uh, we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And you people out there who have no sense of an obligation or a, a need to be faithful in, a, in the house of God, that you, you think you, you don't need a, a pastor, 
You don't need a membership in a congregation where the Bible is believed and faithfully taught. You don't need to be there uh, faithfully to hold up the work with your tithes and offerings and also with your prayers for the leadership to keep the doors open so that the congregation does not have to sell the building and let it become a Mormon hotel. You people out there who, who, who have the, uh, some kind of notion of cheap grace, you need to reread this book, my friend. You need to see who you're dealing with. This is, this is Rob Shaul, who uh, is working out his salvation with fear and trembling, and that's what you have to do. Because even though God called us, and even though he chose us, and even though the miracle of regeneration and all of these glorious things have happened to us, we still have to be, we have to live lives worthy of the gospel. We, we have to be vigilant and we have to uh, make our calling and election sure. Can you say amen? amen. So hallelujah. Amen. Whether you're a Calvinist or an Arminian, I want to tell you there's a there's there are some shades of both in this book and I don't believe that one uh, camp has all the truth I believe there's 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 some some truth here uh, from both camps but the point that I'm making is when you read it you have to know who the author is and how he's how he's talking about himself first and foremost in all of these things he was the Esau in Rivka's uh, 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 womb, who was counting on his being Jewish to help him get into heaven. And, and you know what? It, it wasn't helping him. Nothing was helping him. Uh, the, the mitzvahs weren't helping him. Uh, uh, and, and the more he, 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 he chaffed uh, and kicked against the goads, the, the more uh, difficult it became until finally he ran into Yeshua himself. Hallelujah. And Yeshua himself got a hold of him and seized this Osama bin Laden and made something out of him so that everybody ought to be able to see, if you have eyes to see, that the author of Romans is really not Paul, it's God. Only God could write this book. Amen. And he used uh, somebody who would be an impossible author, as it were, as impossible as trying to get Osama bin Laden to write something that becomes part of the New Testament. And this is so, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you will realize that this whole book was written by God. Because Rav Shaul is a major author. Most of it is either him or his associate Luke. Uh, and, and, and there's just a few small writings written by other people. Lord, I want to pray right now that you get a hold of this, of this generation that slumped over uh, with their tattoos in Starbucks asleep uh, from a wild uh, uh, night of drugs and lost without God, without hope in the world. Oh God, only you can do it, but we must be diligent. We must be like Paul. We must consider ourselves a debtor to every human being, whether they're educated or uneducated, uh, that we would give them the, the, the plan, that God has a wonderful plan for your life. Whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, God has a plan. Please let God work out his plan in your life. Amen. Don't turn your back on the Lord. He loves you. Amen. He loves everyone. He so loved the world. The world, the world that he gave his Ben Yochid, his Zun Fudoroibister, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have Chaye Olam. Amen. Amen.